Hello everybody, welcome to the Great Cosmic Shift with Cyrus Kirkpatrick. This is your host and today we are actually going to be reviewing a channeling session with the theologian known as Emanuel Swedenborg. He is of course the great 18th century uh, mystic, theologian, reformer, inventor, and um, I would say a uh, major figure of the Enlightenment but coming in from a different angle in particular with the formation of Swedenborgianism which is sometimes considered in the same branch as certain elements of spiritualism because Swedenborgianism is a path that looks at the literal manifestations of heaven, the afterlife, and so forth. Now he passed away in the uh, late 1700s but because I am a clairaudient telepath and I have a connection to his work and himself, I decided to reach out to Emanuel Swedenborg using direct methods of clairaudient telepathy, otherwise known in the higher cosmos as mental syncing, which allows a two-way communication to uh, occur. Uh, this ability, many of us have it. It takes training and practice to bust through the collective consciousness spectrum of Earth that keeps people very shy to even admit they have the power because of the fact that it is something so tremendous the very collective consciousness of Earth tends to reject the telepathic powers. But with training, we can actually learn to communicate very easily with groups and people and wherever from the cosmos which includes what we call the afterlife. So a uh, very interesting conversation tonight with Swedenborg. Before we get started, you might know me from Afterlife Topics and Metaphysics. That channel is hacked, as in my Google account is inaccessible. I cannot access my old channel. So if you subscribe to this channel, it greatly helps. If you are from that old channel and perhaps you had joined as a patron or you have joined the Patreon, then um, please get in touch with me if you never receive any benefits of being a patron or if you donated at cosmicshiftawakening at gmail.com. I was indisposed for a long time, so I wasn't able to have any access to my community. Um, what else? Uh, so again, that subscription greatly helps because we are renewing a whole lot, but ultimately looking at things from the angle of the great cosmic shift of planet Earth. With that said, I'm going to go ahead and run the intro. Okay, everybody, welcome back. So I'm doing this without any water. It's a lot to get through. This is a whole transcript. It's a whole direct interview I had with this man, um, a full uh, two and a half centuries since his passing specifically. And I had a lot of fun talking to this guy for hours putting this together. Um, it's a joint effort. It took a lot of editing actually to make it just right. He blamed it on the fact that he was a little bit tipsy when we did the first half of the session and so some of the uh, transcript didn't come out as well as he wanted it to so we went over it and did a lot of edits until it you know until it came out well enough and um interestingly enough there was someone else i was in communication with at the same time who's a friend of mine who was actually trying to manifest in my room at the same time that i was communicating to swedenborg and so there were like all these little sparkly things appearing in my room by my door. Pretty interesting. A lot is happening right now on the Afterlife Topics and Metaphysics Forum, actually. There is um, our friend Eb Costello is having experiences communicating with her husband on the fifth density earth through a, an old radio. 
It's like the communications are just pouring in right now, which is very extraordinary. Of course, you can get involved. Here is that I'm actually going to be reading this article off from the Reddit page, which is r slash afterlife topics. You can also put afterlife topics into Facebook to join there, where I have lots and lots of content and channeled messages and all types of things that I put around on these different platforms. And then sometimes it comes over here to the YouTube, depending on how much work I do, um, what I'm able to commit to this service that I do um, for the planet. Okay, so, um, so here we are. Channel Telepathic Communication with Emmanuel Swedenborg, uh, talking about life on an angelic planet and various other things. So censored by Facebook, read here instead. I couldn't post this transcript on Facebook because they were telling me I was breaking a rule, not knowing which rule it was. Um, okay, this is taken from my upcoming book, The Cosmic Shift of Mankind, to be released later this fall, possibly late fall, where there's going to be an anthology of many including Oscar Wilde, who I posted about on this video, on this uh, channel before, as well as um, uh, Monsieur, Monsieur, Hugh Benson, the uh, Catholic author who is also, that transcript is on Afterlife Topics as well. Okay, so the next man I was in communication with was Swedenborg, and let's go ahead and take a look at what he is saying, if my mouth stays moist because I really am I'm gonna have dry mouth and I'm gonna be coughing it's a lot to get through this is about 6,000 words he had a lot to talk about okay greetings to those reading this anthology what a great pleasure it is to be here to write through the very fingers of this young man Cyrus who has grown into a talent we can recognize throughout the ages it you know, communications like this one is nothing new and is a normal occurrence upon your world what is very different, however, is the nature of any creative artistic pursuit that attacks at the truth, so to speak, which illustrates the importance of this work. My message for those reading comes a full two and a half centuries since my passing, yet you may be reading this book at some ungodly date into the far-flung future, in which case, add as many zeros to that prior date as you like. Now, my commentary is that when we're communicating to the higher densities, depending on where you're communicating, sometimes it's like we're talking about lifespans, ages that go into the millions, billions of years. It's just, you know, it's, things are just so weird for us to imagine. Most importantly, I want to talk about a few prime concepts, potential misconceptions that concern work some are familiar with, like heaven and hell. And also importantly, reminders about the very nature of the migration of souls from the terrestrial to the less than terrestrial, to the higher realities, to the heavenly realms. This is of special importance to the former reality of this man, Swedenborg. For my world, the Earth was a battleground planet, a testing center between light and darkness a prelude to great judgments that were born upon the realities far in between. From the realities of spirit where I once dwelt to the grand heavenly planets of the archangels themselves where I exist now, a magnificent contrast exists for those souls migrating from a world like yours into what awaits. As such, a topic I never quite discussed on your world with the specific details of my encounters with divine beings and how that would someday lead to my life among such angels. Such mysteries will be revealed in these forthcoming pages. It was long a prerogative of mine to understand the very naturalistic, even biologic elements of what a heavenly reality would be like. This became almost an obsession of mine Surely in the olden days at Uppsala University, I would have taken an angel and used every lovely ancient device of microscopy to investigate those angel feathers. 
Back then, we had scant knowledge of subjects like atoms and molecules, just traces of the truth. But armed with such traces of knowledge, I'd been very concerned with trying to understand the compositional elements of a divine being. Why? Well, surely the angelic being must exist in a naturalistic state for what would not be a naturalistic state. All must derive from nature, including realms of divinity. This was my view, who else thought this way? Few, if any. I was standing out like a peacock in the sun. Also, because I thought, surely we must understand worlds beyond this one in literal terms. For most people, it seems divinity is understood in the realm of faith alone. Faith is most important, yet what, I will, yet what will I be doing in heaven? I'd very much like to continue my sciences. I wanted to understand my future life, <coughs> not purely in the light of faith, but also through science and inquiry, the literal imaginings of it all. At this time, I faced an enormous amount of criticism from ecclesiastic authorities because I dared to think in such a way. Why? Because literal terms should be placed into the faithless fire. As they would say, instead we trust in the word and place the material sciences, the literality of things, into the realm of man. Odd, I would say, as this perspective did not appeal to me. Yet subjection to criticism can wear on any soul as it did my own faced by such a constant barrage. Criticisms arise, however, in light of publicity and reputation. What occurred to much attention were my direct communion and communications with angelic beings. This is important to point out because there was a host of them, including communications I dared not reveal publicly, including that of the Savior, Jesus Christ. To reveal the extent of these visitations would place me in a lot of hot water, possibly even now upon your world. However, it goes in my mouth, I'm getting, already I'm getting dry mouth. Mm. However, this will not word me away from revealing these stories. Some of my tales were known about a scant bit of it, I would say. For example, Jesus Christ did visit me in person. And as a rationalist, I did not attribute it to hallucination. And those who knew me understood the reality of such claims coming from a level-headed, rationally-minded, scientific authority as myself. What I did not reveal, however, is that I ate with Jesus, dined with him as a house guest. He even stayed in my home for a night. When our communion finished, he called me his brother and he left my home. Strange, how do you parse such a reality entering your life? It's very difficult to do it. But I am an inquisitive mind and I'd have preferred the Lord Savior Jesus Christ to stay a while so I could poke at him with scientific instruments and figure out the physicality of his existence. Sadly, this event did not go in such a direction. So one thing Mr. Swedenborg told me was, it's like, you know, Cyrus, there is a similarity to our work because in your work, like understanding life after death, you're trying to find the literality of an afterlife. So was I from that 17th, I should say, 18th century perspective. Uh, so Swedenborg continues. So herein lies the challenge going forward so we can be pithy for my role in this anthology. Your world is in a, state of, in a state of confusion about divinity, theology, religion, spirituality, magic, and God. The first is an inability to adapt to change as it arises. The very element of the heavenly kingdoms is adaptation to change and allowing so much to flow. I shall speak shortly of my meetings with the archangels and my eventual migration to their realms However, this point about the turmoil facing your world must be elucidated to a stronger degree first. For you see, institutes, and I shall include even the Swedenborgian fellows, should bear in mind that half-truths are worse than lies. 
I am not speaking ill of any such persons who continue forward in my name, but these plights are simply things that occur and do occur and must be approached vigilantly. A half-truth occurs when one element is correct, another element is false, and the package is presented. No one knows how to unravel it or understand what goes where, and soon an idea persists, like among Lutherans, that masturbation is such an immoral act you can soon be sent into hell. Sounds like uh, Ned Flanders to me. Okay, uh, Swedenborg continues. In fact, to see masturbation in a shameful lens creates a host of psychological issues among people. For one thing, it causes an internalized sense of guilt and shame for elements of nature, completely unrelated to mentality, morality, and, but are classified as such. Okay. It creates a sense in his soul that reality is out to get them, that God's rules do not fit with what is occurring in their midst. It also causes a sense that we are walking a path down a treacherous road with cliffs on other side in the dark, and despite our best attempts at survival, we could fall into hell at any point. Finally, with life's hardships, if we should step onto a road like sexuality for too long, it's the devil's fruit and we are off to the classification of sinner, which only makes the hardships worse. We could go on and on, yet do keep in mind this was all my strong belief set during my day. I believed masturbation was most certainly a detraction from the Lord and a blasphemy against a sacred part of life, the holy conception of a new soul, which should be relegated to a brief important moment of sperm fertilization of an egg, the act of biological fertilization that I was endlessly interested in. However. To explore this beyond that sacred moment was a plight against God and an indulgence. Hmm, most interesting. In order to prevent battles erupting between various factions, there are elements I never spoke about publicly on your world, such as the extent of my visitations with Jesus in my own home. In this same regard, Subjects like the church's view of masturbation, spoken of in such a plain fashion as in this essay, could be quite a new experience for certain long-time readers of mine, especially considering my own standpoint has altered considerably since my days on your world. As you can imagine, um, I, would, I would add an edit here, you know, such as his communications with Jesus and so forth, there are a great many subjects I'd love to get off my chest given this opportunity and platform to speak to an audience within the lower earth. A lot of them call our earth the lower earth. It's interesting why all the Baron friends call it the lower earth studies when they learn about this world, interact with this world, understand how powerful Gaia is. A Gaia is a world of a Gaia is a world of power. But it's still the lower earth a non-advanced civilization. As some recall, in my work I often spoke of the nature of angels, souls that were us from our world, surely transformed into angelic status in realities that are certainly as real as ours. I would reinforce how the natural world must remain natural. What is the world of spirit by contrast? Ah. The mysteries of trying to understand where matter and spirit converge. I can see from the rest of this anthology, other authors have spoken much about this subject. The soul collective versus the manifested higher realities. I will interject and say, just go back and see my reading or my, my, my recital of the communication with Oscar Wilde, who will go into a lot about that. I will not delve so deeply into what has already been explained, however, to put it in simple terms, my work would focus on the organic spirit of life and not the mental realities, although I would spend much time in the mental reality after my passing before walking through those gates into the true dwellings of the archangels 
when you begin communicating literally to that sign, you will hear again and again, stay away from the astral plane, stay away from the hollow heavens, and ultimately migrate beyond the soul collectives and go into the higher density realities, which is what Swedenborg is talking about. Angels, as I've spoken of before, certainly do originate from our world, but the cosmos is vast and wondrous. Excuse me. And those souls elevated to angelic status extend far beyond just the trappings of our one single planet. Creation is too bountiful to be exclusive to just one, to just our one meager world. Unfortunately, ecclesiastic authorities in my day saw things very differently. In time, I would prove to myself the existence of greater realities where angelic authority extends far beyond the reaches of the earth. Even though my constituents saw things very differently, the earth was a singular creation. Mm, the idea of other planets constituting a divine reality was outrageous. I speak now to an audience where perhaps such notions are no longer so outrageous. Before we continue exploring such outrageous ideas, I'd like to summarize a little bit more of my exodus from your world. It was a great series of steps to arrive where I am now, upon an archangelic divine planet. And much of this relates to that very concept of moving from reality of the bardo, the mental lucid states of the mind and spirit, even among the heavenly realms of such an existence, and into the divine manifested reality, as I shall term it. So my life has gone through transformation after transformation. If only I knew back then, uh, parentheses in my era edit what I know now so much I would have written differently so much I would have added or changed and most certainly wouldn't have been going on with my peers about the great follies of masturbation certainly in my day there were greater pressing concerns so what is this realm of archangels I exist in now ah yes I live in a kind of a study hall much to my liking for you see, the realm of the mind, the spirit world, never did suit me as I prefer a naturalistic environment. In a realm of the mind, I never did come to suitable conclusions about the biological nature of heaven, for my mental reality was constructed in a synthetic fashion. Two different modes of being. That is what I learned, actually and an important lesson for the realm of the mind feels physical to the touch and is confusing until it is clear the nature of such an existence so the archangelic forces i first encountered back during my life upon earth were eventually ready to accept me at a certain point in the evolution of my soul into their reality indeed even before my passing I had developed a relationship among the highest order of angelic authority that would, of course, influence my work and my life's purpose. So if you've read Swedenborg's work, Lot Concerns Life Among Angels. Now I shall speak of who I met before within my earthly life, which is the Archangel Jophiel. This was the great wondrous figure that had summoned me to her court from my own home. Wait, surely not Jophiel. Ah, the controversy should begin. Jophiel is a figure from Angelicanism and the Kabbalah, of all places. My credibility would be flame roasted and toasted. It would be as bad as finding out I was masturbating to have a visionary experience with the Archangel Jophiel. Yet, that is precisely what occurred, and I couldn't tell a soul any of the details until now. No less, it was not merely a visionary experience, but I was taken to Jophiel's reality. It should be understood Jophiel is written as companion to the Archangel Metatron. 
This is surely true as well. Metatron now resides around this reality, yet is not a permanent resident. As Metatron is a guiding power and watcher, I would say, of the entire Grand Multiverse. And of course, he is also known as Samael. Now, um, in this channel, I have communicated with Metatron, and Metatron's presence has come into my room. And I saw his outline and shape appear in my bedroom when I was communicating with him some weeks back for a prior video, which concerns some of the mysteries of creation and a mysterious painting that shows up in a in a um, old video game and some really interesting, funny, weird stuff. This is a few videos back you can look at and look into. But interesting, funny, and weird, I'm talking about like things seeded into our culture that, that demonstrate creation itself and how these angels work to make their presence known in our lives in little subtle ways, showing us things, inserting their influence, inserting elements of grand existence and wisdom, and things from the multiverse, things beyond our imagination, placing them around our lives and even into our pop culture. Jophiel in a great assembly is in power along her deputies, Michael and Gabriel, and ascended above them is the archangel Ariel, who is, by the way, that's Ariel is the top. There are many more on this assembly to note, including grand elder beings of the cosmos dating to the dawn of creation, something unfathomable, unfathomable yet real with names never before uttered among the lips of people from your world. Even this information shared so far would have caused too much controversy during my day, perhaps of a deadly variety against myself or my loved ones. It is not something to trifle with. The extremities of the church and the power of such authority in my era of the 18th century. Yet there I was under the magnificent throne of the archangel Jophiel, who was the ruler in her kingdom. And keep in mind, this is happening to Swedenborg from his own home. So he was, as has happened to me many times, manifested into this world. I have never been to this world. I've been to a different world, known as Shainara, which is connected to this planet. So let's continue. Others surrounded her with wings, many with armors and weapons and flaming swords. And there she sat upon a golden throne, and every bit of illumination, glory, grandiosity one could imagine. Yet there I was, noticing the small details. What was this environment? A real place, literally. And there were others. I noticed men with beards and adornments and offering her praise or pleading to her. And she appeared to be a very busy woman. So I quipped, Archangel Jophiel, you are a very busy woman. And here I am mucking about. So sorry for my troubles. Of course, Jophiel went straight to my mind and said, No, Emmanuel Swedenborg, come hither. And so I did. So up some marble steps I went, quite contented to be in heaven. For heaven appears as anticipated as it had been for me in my life. And to think, on my mind, were the opportunities of this world. Sure, this reality would be ideal for a man like myself. I could see myself among those bearded blokes over yonder, maybe a scribe or a scientist in the court of these angels. But most importantly, I felt to be in a reality that was not my own. No, certainly not, because every moment of this reality had magic behind it. Every scent, every perfume, every glance of every being, every communication occurring mentally, often rapidly. Every moment felt an awe-inspiring gravitas that cannot, could never be described in words, which they often tell us. We must not even try. Yet manifest in physical reality it was, which, which is the same not a dream reality, not not a mental reality. It's um, a place where we share our tangibility. Jophiel looked at me and spoke. You may also call me Florella. Ah, what a beautiful name, Florella. 
Surely this queen of archangels, true beautiful name, had never been uttered on my world before. Therefore, I can simply go revise the ancient Kabbalah, rewrite current scripture, and be thought of as a madman. Alternatively, I shall keep the name Florella somewhere near and dear in my heart, while at the same time never revealing the full extent of this particular experience, lest I fall into a kind of civil war upon my return to my old reality. Ah, yes, the great taboos of orthodoxy come home to roost, as they say. Fortunately, the archangelic powers work in mysterious ways, yet so does the Lord. And what Joe Feel intended for me was to take my reality and turn it upside down. Joe Feel's plan to summon me to her kingdom was initiated because of my great influence. At the time, I did not consider myself to have a great legacy that would echo over the ages, perhaps turning into its own denomination. The archangels saw it differently and intended to bring me into their world for a set of valuable lessons. Okay. Some of these lessons I did bring back to my flock. An important lesson would concern the nature of the angelic powers in a cosmological perspective. This led to my understanding of planetary bodies, an existence within a higher strata of life. That the planetoid is not a random encumbrance of nature, but a divine recognition that casts its power into all creation as dwellings of civilization and great existences beyond our own. I was taken to see through mental power the entire embodiment of the planetoid I was on, a planetoid of divine power, angelic power, and this was heaven? Ah, surely. Who would believe that heaven existed as a planet? Yet, if we are to imagine heaven, why not a planet? Planets are a part of creation, so let's rejoice that planets exist within our great hereafter as the physicality, tangibility, molecular sense-making of divinity. Interesting. Next, the Archangel Florella sent me to meet the Archangel Lachiandros. Not a name known about in our history is yet for me to even be concerned about this matter, tells many tales. For those on the earth, at least per the age this book is written, tend to consider their denominations to be infallible, completely understood, and no new knowledge is allowed. For example, there is a great prophet, that prophet arises, that prophet's word becomes holy scripture and nothing else should be taken away nor added to it, period, ever. Swedenborg informs me I'm going to probably make enemies with the Swedenborgian types of, you know, the people who um, are very, very much committed to his work because I am proposing that he is communicating and altering his, you know, his scripture. And Swedenborg expressed this kind of great concern to me after I finished this interview, okay? Okay. Um, and so I have suffered attacks against me most recently by those who reject that I am truly Emanuel of Swedenborg for the simple matter of having had changes in perspective. Apparently, the real Emanuel of Swedenborg is sitting somewhere in a cloud, quite upset about this imposter running around with stories of archangels with names other than those taught in ancient texts. Oh dear. And well, Lachiandros was a woman with, a, with fiery auburn hair, a few freckles here and there, the lacy garment like a form-fitting white tunic that appears with ruffles around the edges. Lachiandros was a bit taller than myself and wore silver and leather boots, a bit like a how girl, I suppose. So she took my arm and brought me from the throne of Florella and off to tour the realities of heaven. To make matters even worse, La Chiandros told me the name of her world was Sando Terai. All right, 
and so heaven is named Sandotirai. Surely I shall go out amongst my fellow clerics and let everyone know with great zeal heaven has a name, it is Sandotirai, and everyone can celebrate Swedenborg having finally lost his mind completely. It had been a ways coming, but it finally occurred. So what was this reality like? Let's put it this way, I was no longer in my home. My bed was empty, much like Ebenezer Scrooge, I suppose. I was taken away to this other world from out of my bed. Maybe another analogy could be Peter Pan. My embodiment on that world was my former body that had moments prior been tucked away into my wool blankets. Why former? Because through being physically exposed to a reality I would later know by its technical terms, the sixth density, my entire bodily composition began to transform and that transformation remained even after I returned home. I became a different type of man. I said I was transformed by the miracle of heaven and people did not know what it meant. But truly my molecular composition turned into a more robust, more energetic existence by virtue of entering the sixth density molecular composition. And it would only be much later after my physical death that I learned the true nature of physics as they relate to divinity, and as I was always curious about, and the true nature of the transformation I had undertaken. After this tour, I was taken by La Chiandros to an adjacent temple that appeared in almost different colors than we'd ever imagined. Our same colors it on a higher magnitude, and up the stairs we went into this magnificent temple of beautiful pastel colors and engravings signifying ancient histories beyond my scope of imagination. By the time I left that temple complex, things had changed quite a bit for old Swedenborg because I was forced to reevaluate certain principles. I was brought back to the throne of Archangel Jophiel. She had a laugh, a very lovely laugh, from this thin-framed woman with long dark hair. She said, I hope you enjoyed our world, Swedenborg. I want you to please take the wisdom of our reality back to your earth so we can spread greater knowledge and work toward the eventual great shift of your planet into our realities. It's like she snapped her fingers and I was back in my bed. Now what am I alluding to? The worst, most blasphemous thing of all that could never be repeated or I could have literally found my head on a pike outside the Swedish court. La Chiandro's favorite my rebellious nature, my predilection toward upending the clergy in a most subversive fashion, my ability to balance multiple realities at once, but was disturbed about my views on sexuality deeply embedded through my religious heritage. La Chiandro's, over the course of about 45 minutes, decided to introduce a different perspective to me and certainly you understand what I mean. The issue is this. Such an experience was, re was reserved for one like myself. A sexual experience of such caliber on your earth could potentially disrupt a man's life. The reason for this is the archangelic reality in higher worlds in general transcend far beyond anything the people of earth could understand or fathom. And so a man of the earth may lose the ability to integrate back into one's old life after experiencing such splendor. And what is that splendor like? Well, on a surface level, it might, quote, appear similar to your own existence. For example, my sex organs were quite functional, to say the least. Well, that's terrible. We must move beyond those fleshly instruments. This does not sound so divine at all, Mr. Swedenborg. This is surely not the, word of, the words of this great man, 
heresy. They're not so fast. I would dare say these organ structures have existed in human fashion for an unfathomable, unfathomable era since the dawn of creation. It's just on our world, sexuality is a muted experience. This is my editor's note. Asterisks are added on this post because of internet censorship. So, sexuality is a muted experience, but not on this world of Sando Terai. Through manifestation on that world, one is now a part of that existence, and suddenly our old Earth is just a bunch of silly nonsense. An average person taken in sexually by a woman, an angel like Lashiandros, would enchant that man or woman to such an extent he or she would never be able to think about anyone else or possibly anything else ever again and certainly not clunky mortal sexuality. However, for better or worse, Swedenborg was a special circumstance. This was done to me because of my growing enormous influence which threatened to throw together another puritanical movement of sorts. This was made clear to me through a vision Lashiandros embedded into my mind that it would be bad for society, that my great influence and work threatened to cause mass societal condemnations against prostitution or even premarital affairs, perhaps to pain of death, as occurs during such radical reformations many times throughout history. It was Florella's plan to exercise this belief out of me. What better instrument than Lachiandros? And I blew it. You see, this was the great magnificent experience of all time. Truly, I returned to bed my old life. As months passed, I thought long and hard, very philosophically, about every element of my quote, ultimate vision, and finally concluded, the sexual experience was meant for me and only me. In fact, that type of divine experience was a way for angels to test me, and I should double down on my views of sexuality as a sacred experience reserved only for husband and wife, and less into preferably procreation purposes only. How could I backtrack? I think part of my mind could not handle that reality, that life, that entire method of existence, and so I put it out of my mind for the next 200 years. More recently, it's been very important to reevaluate these elements in light of so many from these realities springing forth across your higher cosmos and my ability to return to the world of Sando Terai and discover how reality here on a day-to-day -day basis is everything I imagined it to be during my first visitation and so much more. Let's see how much is left because my neck hurts. We've got a little bit longer to go, folks. Hmm. I think what I'm going to do, everybody, is I'm going to take a break here and split this into the second part. So, um,. So we're kind of stopping around here. Um, so in the comments down below, students, since we know we're, we're stopping right at this point because honestly, my mouth is going to be too dry and it's very late. There's, there's actually quite a bit more road to cover in this communication. What do you think is happening so far? Swedenborg's views in this world tend to be very more on the puritanical side. He's not too big on an idea like this. He is saying this is what happened to him. He never revealed it. He never revealed it to the public um, because it most certainly would have gone against his own teachings, but he yielded to that and he deeply regrets it now living on the angelic planet of Sando Terai. Um, and that he is seemingly very hesitant to reveal these things um, because of the fact that he is going against his own, shall we say, theology, to a certain extent. 
Now, Swedenborg really made clear that there's these angelic realities. Now, what do I know about Sando Terai because of my own communications? It exists in what we would call the seventh density, when it is a planet surrounded by um, numerous other what we would call divine planets. And this includes assemblies of angels or the grand assembly which includes the divine higher beings that have, in a sense, jurisprudence, if that's the correct word, across all of creation. How big is all of creation? Endless trillions upon trillions upon trillions upon quadrillions of universes. That's the grand cosmic creation known as the multiverse so it i was surprised to learn because i i knew about, i never knew the name but i knew about archangel jophiel and had some element of communication with her before and that jophiel ariel which is a woman i have been in communication with also as well as gabriel michael others this is that constitution that represents the higher archangelic order that eventually migrated down and essentially would find itself in contact and assembly with the um, angelic order which was also a part of the Greek Orthodox Church from a world connected to our own and, and the communication with Lorna the prior video speaks about this so that's it for now so stay tuned for the next part of this communication where we are going to go into Swedenborg's views on society on this planet and what is going terribly, terribly wrong, also leading up to the shift. So that's it for now. Thank you for watching this episode and hope to see you soon on part two of my communication with uh, Manuel Swedenborg. And thank you for subscribing as we rebuild this channel from its old iteration. This is Cyrus. Talk to you next time.